This episode of the Arts Page spotlights all local artists, ranging from traditional to truly unique. First, sit alongside two Milwaukeeans carrying on the intricate Ukrainian art of Pisinka, transforming eggs into art. See how Julie Vondervelen creates textured artworks and even sculptures by using strips of paper. Watch creative ceramic creatures come to life in the hands of Bayview artist Jeff Rosh. And we pay tribute to Pewaukee artist Ramona Audley, who left a vibrant and colorful legacy with her artworks and her attitude. That's all coming up now on the Arts Page. Hi, I'm your host, Sandy Max, and we start this all-local episode of the Arts Page with Milwaukeean Ulana Tyshinsky, who teaches the Ukrainian art of Pisinka. These handmade Easter eggs are decorated using a delicate process perfected over generations. My name is Ulana Tyshinsky, and I have been creating Pisinka for many, many years. I've been doing it probably for 50 years. My name is Ann Gruno. I have been creating Pisinka since 1982. Pisinka comes from the root word pisate, which means to write. And basically, we are writing symbols on an egg. The pagans in Ukraine started decorating eggs because it was a symbol of life. It's the rebirth of life in the springtime. And so we have a lot more eggs availability in the springtime, and they decided to decorate them in honor of the rebirth of the earth. When Christianity was introduced in Ukraine in 988, then a lot of the symbols that were pagan symbols took on Christian meanings, and then Christian symbols were also then applied to the eggs as well. A lot of the eggs today, Pisanka eggs, are a combination of both pagan and Christian symbols. Traditionally, it is from mother to daughter or son. It's my heritage, it's, it's, it's Ukrainian heritage, and I'm very happy to say that a lot of people not, who are not Ukrainian have adopted you know, the, the making of Pisanka. It's something that's been done in the springtime and then only during Lent, and then you put your supplies away until the following year. And what you need to make a pisanka is a, an egg, a kistka, the beautiful wax that's beeswax and has a scent of honey, and a candle. That's mm -hmm. all you need. And the kistka is a copper cone that is attached to a stick, or originally a bone. And the copper is such a wonderful conductor of the melting wax in the inside. You're actually writing or drawing with it beeswax. It really adheres so solidly to the egg shell that that is what preserves the color of the egg. It's a wax resist process and um, it is very time consuming. So anybody who wants to do this really has to be set to do something for several hours. You don't get immediate gratification from this. What you get is a, it's a meditative experience. A pisanka, it starts off as a white egg and you let the beeswax melt onto the white shell wherever you want things to remain white. That beeswax is going to preserve the white of the egg. When you put that entire egg into a yellow dye, that whole egg is going to be yellow except for the black lines. It's just the beeswax that's black because it's from the flame and the carbon. So you pull it out and you have a yellow egg. Then you decide what on that egg are you going to want to remain yellow. And then you apply the wax melting it again onto all of the areas that you want to remain yellow. And you cover that with beeswax also, and you put it into the orange dye. And you start from the lightest color, you go down to the darkest color. So you start off with yellow and you go to black. 
the more you apply the beeswax, the darker the egg becomes and the less you really see. And the most wonderful thing about making a pisanka is the final stage where it's, it's in its darkest color and it could, most of it at the time it's black. And then you unveil it by melting off all the wax. And that's where the colors come through because you can't see until you get to the final stage. When you do a piston cut, it is always divided symmetrically in two. Half of the egg is to represent life on earth and the other half is to represent life after death. And that's, you know, a piston cut is a, an Easter egg. So it's always symmetrical. For one of the beginning ones, that's easily three hours. When you get into the more complex eggs, I would say you can go up to six hours before the unveiling. An intact egg is used because the egg itself represents life. And the whole point of decorating a pisanka is to celebrate life. Over the years, the egg, the white, will disintegrate more or less, and the yolk will become a lump and you'll have a rattling egg. You don't put it in an airtight container. You don't put it ever in styrofoam. You don't put it into direct sunlight. But after, I would say, six years or so, it'll be fine and it can last forever. It's something that's beautiful and we want to share it with others. See more photos of these beautiful eggs and learn much more on this Ukrainian tradition online at pisinke.info. Milwaukee artist Julie Vondervelen uses pieces of paper to tell her stories, not by writing on them, but by literally weaving her stories into shape. I started to pull away from the computer and start to work with the book format and paper as my main material. Working with the sheet of paper and manipulating it in, in various different ways and I just loved it. My name is Julie Vonnerbellum and I am a paper artist. For me it's, it's about this curiosity of, of working with paper as the material because it's just so commonplace um, and we see it every day but for me I, I try to kind of work with it and manipulate it and, and find new ways to form it and to sculpt with it and I've continued to tell stories or emotions or express my feelings or experiences through all of the objects that, that I've made. So I started making handmade books, so I was folding the sheets and binding them, sewing them. But then I started to say, okay, can I, can I build or sculpt with this as well? I made a dress and then I made shoes and then just having that object come to life in that three-dimensional format was really inspiring to me because it just kept that curiosity of, okay, I built that, now what if I can build this? So it's just kind of evolved that way. Everything I've done with paper has been that pursuit of, can I do this with paper? Make an object out of a non-traditional material. It starts with a sketch, has that story, and then the story's printed on it or written on it in some regard, but there's always some sort of written element, some sort of typography. It's really simple uh, in terms of the materials and the tools that I use. It's the blades, the paper, and a PVA glue, and that's, that's really it. Um, but it's just mostly just paper holding and molding itself together. It starts with one big sheet of paper and I always have kind of a blank slate um, and I struggle with getting into the next step without cutting it apart. <laughs> so I, t I typically have one big sheet and I cut it into strips and then um, it's called paper plating where you weave strips of paper into the other strips of paper. I love that textural experience that it provides. 
it's tedious and it, it takes a long time to cut out all those strips and, and then to weave them back together. Um, but that becomes a time for me to kind of meditate on what exactly this piece will evolve into. The paper will hold itself together, but then I reinforce that by putting a sheet underneath it and I glue that surface together. So it's the woven piece and then glued to another surface. And then I can sculpt with that. In previous works, I've stitched over the top of it to make sure that it holds together some, with some of the garment pieces, but I can embroider over the top of it. That tends to help hold everything together. The title of the exhibition at the Alphonse Gallery is called En Route. The show is a series of sculptural objects, recent collage work that I've been exploring, textile weavings with the paper. I look at it as an important cultural exhibition. I see Julie as an artist that really connects with paper, and paper as a fragile medium, but as an opportunity to, to transform our visions of something else. I see her stories woven in about herself, and stories about growth and metaphors for her existence in life that we can all relate to and comments on society and the consumer con culture. We have three-dimensional works. We have Julie's cuckoo clocks and her watches. We have her uh, piece epilogue, which is a number of cut, looks like cut pieces of a tree, so you can see the inner rings. And then we have a number of the larger pieces, some uh, freeform, which are very nice. Uh, hung, they just, you know, exist within the space and not behind glass. It's about the process, the, the, her journey, and working through things and, and taking time to process things and transform. Pieces like these intricate weavings that really you have to slow down. So you get, when you look at her pieces, that it's a meditative process. I am just proud of the way that I've continued to pursue the creative problem solving process, making these pieces. And that drives me every day. You can see Julie Von Der Vellen's paper creations up close at the James May Gallery in Algoma, Wisconsin later this year. Browse more of her unique sculptures and paintings on her official website, juliebondervellen.com. Next, we visit with ceramic sculptor Jeff Roche of Bayview. Roche uses natural elements and animals to create human-like sculptures that connect us with the earth and with our emotions. To me, my pieces are three-dimensional canvases. It's very fun to have these creature people. I think of them as ecosystems of all kinds of creatures coming together, making a bigger being, much like nature is. My name is Jeff Rash, and I'm a ceramic sculptor. Ever since I was a little kid, and that was the thing that I really excelled at, is working with um, clay. Uh, it was plasticine back when I was a little kid and I would just remember it was in fifth grade I made a plasticine pig and it was the best in the class. And so that's where I got my start. My work with clay um, involves building hollow forms. Um, and so I construct uh, the pieces with about an inch or half inch thickness all the way around, depending on how big they are. I really try to keep that about the same. It gets too thick, things happen, pieces crack. Um, so there, you know, each piece is built hollow, uh, like a pot. I think if I was going to make just pieces that I want to make, they would be all life-size human sculptures. Um, but I do try to 
supply different sizes for everybody else. So the average person can take a piece home with them. Variety is the spice of life. <laughs> for a long time, I was um, stacking animals, just making sculptures of stacked animals. And I always wanted to work with the human form, but I wasn't sure exactly you know, if I started stacking human forms, it might get kind of grisly. And, and so I, one day, uh, it clicked that, heck, I could make human forms by stacking animals. And that's what I did. When I start a piece, um, I work from uh, photographs of, say, a human form, and I have images of that person in pose from 360 degrees, so images all the way around. And I make sure, I, I blow them up on my walls, and, and I use a calipers to get the measurements right, proportions right, um, and so that's where I start, is, is getting the human form correctly proportioned. It's difficult. It, it, it's something that if it's wrong, it's wrong. Very obvious to people, you know, that the anatomy is wrong. You can fudge with animals. People just don't know, you know, they don't pay as much attention. And so you have to do things with the human form to get it right. And if it isn't, at least to me, and I, and I think I'm more picky because it's my work, but uh, it needs to feel right. And then I sit back and think, well, what kind of an animal will fit in this muscle group to make this feel right? And so it, it, then that just kind of evolves. And, and I don't know exactly what it's going to be until it happens. Recently, my pieces have been very earthy colors. I use a lot of browns and greens and things that you can just find outdoors find it in your own backyard, my backyard, but after a while I get a little bored and then I will go back and, and add color. My piece behind me here you can see is very colorful and I have koi in my backyard and so it's fun to change it up and, and add lots of color. I'm really have always been drawn to nature as a little kid. I would wander in the woods, catch creatures, um, just enjoy exploring and, and that stuff. And, and it's just something that's always kind of a longing for to go back to. And so I find uh, using nature in my work now is, is, is something that I can draw on and, and just continually explore nature and go from there. I have a product called Wall Spots and they are faces that have a lot of fun with creating different expressions and, and I like to have these groupings of faces and have them interact with each other. It's kind of, again, the, the ecosystem thought, but this time it's more emotional relationships between people. And my faces, which, uh, they're like little mini green men. And they, again, are taken from putting the human form and putting them back into nature. And so the leaf form is something that you find in the wild and merge that with the human form and, and conversations with each other. Well, it's fun showing my pieces at art shows. Um, you get a variety of people coming through and it's fun to look at people's expressions as they look at my pieces and quite often they laugh or uh, Occasionally, I've had people start crying in my booth over pieces. I think people have emotional reactions to my work because I think there's a longing, especially as urban dwellers, to, to feel the earth, to, to get back to it, to, to find something simpler, more natural, um, 
instead of the busy, crazy life that we live in with cell phones and mechanical things, um, it's an escape. It's a fantasy, and it's a place that you know people want to plunge into. <laughs> I can't think of any other job that I'm qualified for than doing this. This, there is no choice. This is where I have to be. You'll have the chance to see Jeff Rasha's nature-inspired sculptures up close at the Morning Glory Art Fair this August on the plaza outside Pfizer Forum. Browse more of his creatures and curiosities on his website, jeffrosh.net. Finally, we pay tribute to an inspiring artist who passed away late last year. Retired art teacher Ramona Audley loved the possibility of what could be created out of discarded items, reimagining those pieces into brightly colored, quirky sculptures. I still don't really have a good name for what I do. It's just fun. And I love every minute that I'm working on it. I'm Ramona Audley, and I am an artist. I retired, but I could not give up the art that was so much a part of my life. Ramona does very eclectic art. She calls it 100% art for a lot of different reasons. Uh, my favorite one is it is 100% Ramona. I stamped everything 100% art so that everybody would know it's just like 100% cotton. She's very flamboyant. She loves colors, loves detail, animals, flora, fauna, everything. I. I'm always looking, I'm always looking for things that might end up in a landfill. She'll find a piece that most people would look at and not give it a second thought. She can look beyond that and say, okay, if this was mine, what would I do with it to make it fit in my house? And in her house, bright colors, checkers, flowers, you know, anything that looks like the outdoors that now she can bring inside, that's what she likes to paint and that's what she's the best at. And it's some way of expressing me. I think my art is something that, that starts uh, growing way down deep inside me. It's something that I have a feeling for. She'll look at something that's broke and say, I can fix that, or I know somebody who can fix it and I can make it look so much better than what it is now. Uh, a lot of these items are designed to be either indoor or outdoor use. We want to make sure we're finding stuff that can withstand the elements. So anything animal related is great. Anything to incorporate flowers is a, is a big thing for her. Everything's all done by hand. She's got a couple different varieties of paints that she used, but they're all high gloss, liquid base enamels. So you have to use a really on these a really good quality of paint. I put on multiple coats and I look at them and maybe something comes to mind. It gives me an opportunity to use color. I love ev everything that is color. I don't think that I really love things that are completely realistic, but I like the idea of putting different colors together and see what I'm doing grow. She likes using these intense colors. The brighter, the better. They look great when you first put them on, but once you put on this top coat to seal it, it just electrifies it. It looks even more intense than what it started with. The black piping that's on the outside is one of the last things that she will do. Again, one of her trademarks. Let's put down the flowers, but instead of trying to do a traditional shading on it like a normal painter would do, she's just gonna give it more of that block primitive style with the outlining on each one just really sets off the colors. I think you just have to do your thing. It's pop art, but it's eclectic at the same time. I think we can kind of bridge the gap between traditionalists and people like modern art and pop art, and these items will fit the bill. You know, to look at your mother and think of her as an artist, you saw it all these years, but to then suddenly see the reaction that people have, you're like, well, you know, maybe she's got something here. If it serves a purpose in your life, it makes, if it makes you feel better, or it's something that you really, really want to do, do it. You've 
got some inner feelings, you've got some inner emotions, the best way to express it is going to be through artwork. And she did that all during the early years and she still does it to this day. Now here you can have a local talent that's here in Pewaukee that suddenly can do these really interesting things. But when you see this, it does make you think, it does make you smile, it does make you laugh, and it just makes you look at things a little bit differently. So if they always remember that about Ramona, I think that's a big success. I don't ever want to get to the point where I can't keep on doing because I like them. They are much fun to do. A memorial to Ramona Audley will take place later this spring at Gallery One in Waukesha. See more of her whimsical art and find out about her memorial event on the website tinyurl.com slash Ramona Audley. Is there a unique Wisconsin artist or arts organization you'd like to see on the arts page? Please call us at 414-797-3760 with your story ideas and comments about the show. I'm Sandy Max. Thank you for watching and please join us next time for another half hour full of art on the arts page.